now moving outside of a, a least cost to more of a most predictive, most profit model. Um, so I'm excited for that and what that's that's really bringing. Um, but to come back to students, um, one of the things we're trying to figure out, and I think a lot of our institutions are trying to figure out, is how can we make our students more data literate so that they can go out and about to um, really implement some of these things as they're coming. And they, the change is happening so quick. So part of it is getting them nimble enough to be able to, to uh, address some of those things. Hi everyone, welcome again in another episode of the Poetry Nutrition Black Belt. I'm your host, Fatima Adhikari. We have a very special guest today. Uh, he is Dr. Todd Applegate from University of Georgia. Dr. Applegate, welcome to the show. Thank you, Pratima. It's great to be here with you today. Thank you, and it's nice to have you as well from our side. So, Dr. Applegate, um, we I know you <laughs> a lot, but for our audience and everything, could you just tell me a little bit about, about your background, you yourself, where did you do your graduate school, where are you from, and now we can um, continue. Sure, happy to. Um, I have the pleasure of serving as department head here at the University of Georgia in the Department of Poultry Science. Uh, it'll be going on eight years this, uh, this at the end of the year. Before that, I was on faculty at Purdue University. I had a split appointments, extension and research, uh, served in that capacity for 15 years. Uh, I did my bachelor's and master's at Iowa State in pre-vets and then animal science, uh, saw the poultry world as I was finishing up my undergrad, uh, did my PhD at Ohio State, mostly up at their branch campus up in Worcester, Ohio, in the heart of Amish country. I uh, had the, the good fortune of also then uh, doing a postdoc at the University of Maryland with uh, Dr. Rosalina Onhell for a year before I started my faculty gig at uh, Purdue. I also know you have a lot of experience in the research side of it, especially nutrition side of it. Um, and basically what I expect today is kind of, uh, you know, how, how you have seen the poultry industry overall been changing when you're a graduate student and now you are department head and you are, you have seen a lot. So could you share some of these um, kind of focusing more into nutrition side of it? Yeah, no, I, I see a lot of things happening. Um, I think the most that I would kind of gear my mind towards and, you know, one of those worries, I think, at, at night on are we doing justice to our graduate students coming out and preparing them. Uh, in the nutrition realm, I'd say probably over the past decade, one of those things that has really changed is us needing to really think through where we are on say primary ingredients on ingredient handling uh, the cost relationships of what we had even five ten years ago on what we had put on safety margins on our formulations um, has much more severe financial ramifications now than it did a decade ago um, so really we're looking at that but the, the fun thing is, and we haven't solved this, so it's a great opportunity for, for folks earlier in their career. Sure. <laughs> um, I look back to where we are on just formulation software, right? So formulation software since the early 70s has been largely linear least cost form formulation, right? In, in its base form, that really has not changed um, since the early 70s. At that point, you know, it was really, you know, data storage and computing power was was our limitation. Those aren't limitations anymore. Um, now with machine learning, AI, our ability to integrate different systems to a formulation package are, are there. So I think we're really poised on this data tsunami of being able to integrate a lot of things from uh, more real time as to feeding in data from uh, incoming ingredients into what that looks like to change formulation. 
Um, but now moving outside of a, a lease cost to more of a most predictive, most profit model. Um, so I'm excited for that and what that's, that's really bringing. Um, but to come back to students, um, one of the things we're trying to figure out, and I think a lot of our institutions are trying to figure out, is how can we make our students more data literate so that they can go out and about to um, really implement some of these things as they're coming. And they, the change is happening so quick. So part of it is getting them nimble enough to be able to, to uh, address some of those things. On the research side of it, I also know you have you have a lot of research areas that you have worked on and a lot of experience, even under nutrition and not just nutrition, gut health and microbiome. So we're not going to go a lot into the microbiome and thing, but just kind of in a general, um, especially going to gut health side of it. Um, what do you have? What, what have you seen in the U.S. market? Like different, there are different gut health products being utilized by poultry companies and different uh, farms. So, what what is a trend? Like just kind of seeing from uh, what has been done in the, uh, what was there last ten years and now, and where the future kind of look like for the gut health side of it. Um, I'm I'm really excited because there's. We, we've really matured in this conversation, I'd say, with potential additives that are there as well as in the pipeline. Um, my, my previous worry was that we were talking about generalizing things within a particular bucket area, whether it be probiotics or prebiotics. You know, I think several of us have always been on the, the messaging of we need to really understand individual products within each of those as they are refined and selected um, for their targeted use because it's 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 hard to generalize in many categories the fun thing for me is really where we are today and i think there's a lot of products coming out um you know so what we've worried about in the past is consistency of producing a, a mode of action in the animal um, and so that's been one of the downfalls historically to, to that pro those pro different product lines. Today, I think we've gained a lot of strength on increasing that level of consistency. Um, but we're having so many things come that are, are utilizing either synthetic biology or predictive types of things to begin to address that consistency of product. Proven on the farm, trusted on the plate, let our technologies help make your production goals a reality. Learn from the experts how carbohydrates can improve nutrient utilization, gut health technologies differ by type, and how liquid smoke can light your bird performance on fire. Kerry isn't just leading in animal agriculture, we're innovating it. Thank you for sharing those experiences. And I guess maybe my, in a research side, like, like last but not least question, um, so mycotoxin. <laughs> So <laughs> you have a lot of, I should not leave this topic out. So you have, again, another great experience in this area. So my question is, um, what is more important in, in uh, mycotoxin side of it, and especially in the U.S. best diet, like in corn we have, and what have we learned? And what does it look like? What do we do here to screen those issues? Yeah, the, the, the screening tools, at least on the, the, the immediate side have greatly improved over time. There's some things some of our colleagues here at USDA uh, ARS are doing here in Athens that are very exciting as well to, to bring some new tools to the table. Uh, one of the things that I think I'd like to message at least is that um, we've had a much greater uh, understanding at least of our, our primary mycotoxins of concern in the U.S. as well as in Europe are typically fumonacin and deoxynevalanol for poultry. And those two, one of the concerns always that if you do corn on corn, on corn year after year, you're going to get a, an, in especially in no-till systems, going to get a buildup probably of some of those those fungal matter in in the soil and therefore baselines of those mycotoxins depending upon growing conditions and things probably are increasing a little bit over time. It was kind of a confluence of things happening where we were now entering into an antibiotic free era as well to have a greater focus on the gut. 
um, to better understand how some of those mycotoxins and those conditions actually are perpetuating and making some of the the uh, the enteritis that we were seeing in those birds a little bit more severe, lasting a little bit longer, having a little bit more impact on performance than what we were seeing uh, traditionally. So we have a much better understanding of where some of those things are. Now the question is, how do we make sure we monitor for those ahead of time? And are there other tools that we can utilize to take care of them, right? Yeah. Traditional um, inorganic substances like binders do wonderful with aflatoxin. They frankly suck at <laughs> yeah. anything with fumonacin and deoxynivalanol. So it's creating that next generation of, of tools and additives that we can add to deal with those particular mycotoxins. Dr. Applegate, again, thank you so much for joining this today's episode. And thanks for sharing all your experiences and about a little bit about poultry science, UGA. And thanks for being with us today. And good luck on the new building. And I hope to see the new soon. Thank you, Pratima. It's been great talking with you this, this afternoon. Thank you all again. And I have to sign up from today's episode of Poultry Nutrition Black Belt. I'll see you all later. Have a great day.